gods. Who are they? What are they? And is it possible that these beings, whose origins are from ancient times, are the unseen catalysts of modern culture? Is it possible that these gods lie behind the most pivotal events, forces, and movements taking place in our nation and around the world at this very moment? Is it possible that what we in the modern world take as nothing more than ancient mythology could actually possess a reality beyond our fathoming? Who is the possessor? The enchanter? The destroyer? And the sorceress? Could a sign that has appeared all over America and the world be linked to the gods of Mesopotamia? And if so, what does it actually mean? Is it possible that the gods are even affecting your life right now? How can you recognize it? And what can you do about it? Well, hey guys, uh, we're gonna start something new for the next couple weeks. We just want y'all to join in a conversation about this idea of the return of the gods. Before we dive into going over what's gone on really last night and the weeks to come, uh, let's talk through a little bit. Where did this come from? Uh, you went on a trip. You heard about this book. So I, I got invited to participate, speak at the National Day of Prayer and Repentance in Washington, D.C. at the Museum of the Bible. A uh, powerful day, really was. And uh, Tony Perkins, which uh, co-hosted the event with our good friend Jim Garlow, uh, got up and uh, said, I have read a book that has changed my entire outlook. Now, when someone like Tony Perkins makes that statement, yeah. get your attention. Uh, uh, he's a part of Family Research Council, head of Family Research Council. And he had Jonathan Kahn, who's the author of the book. The name of the book, again, is Return of the Gods. Uh, we get the title from that. He spoke for about 45 minutes. It so uh, captured my attention, they had given the books out to everybody. That's, that's how wow. important they thought this was, that to everybody that was in attendance there, they gave one of these books. Uh, I read it before I got home. I mean, literally before the plane landed in uh, Fresno, I, I had consumed the thing, and the information that was in this book was eye-opening. It's one of those books that, okay, now I understand some things. And I said, people need to know about this, and so uh, that's when we began to put together this series. So everything that we do is based out of this book. Uh, this is not original content to me. Obviously, we're adding stuff that, that uh, has to do specifically with us here in California, mm -hmm. those types of things. And this book was written, uh, I think, a year ago, a little over a year ago. So obviously, we're bringing some things more up to date, and it just it even gets more amazing. But that's, that's where this thing came from is that Jonathan Conn and I would encourage anybody uh, to get this book and, and read along with us. This, this whole concept is not new, um, especially uh, spiritual warfare, what's going on. The last, we did a series called Speak of the Devil uh, weeks ago, months ago, um, really talked about this. Um, you almost thought about this as the second kind of segment of that. Can you lean in a little bit to so, that? So Speak of the Devil, uh, part one, really dealt with spiritual warfare on a personal standpoint. We talked about demon possession, demon oppression, and how that the devil works in the lives of individuals. And, uh, and it was a great series that we did there. After I read this book, I thought, wait a minute, this is part two because this book deals with demonic influence on a societal level, culturally, and how they have influence in the past and how we're seeing that they're doing the same thing now. So that's why we, we've called this Speak of the Devil part two, uh, Return of the Gods, because now it broadens it out to what's happening in society. So our goal today is going to be to kind of talk through, uh, as hard as it's going to be, talk through uh, the content, content of yesterday. Um, you spoke to the church, went on for an hour. You, it was like a drinking from a fire hose um, because there's so much content. And you had to lay the, uh, the groundwork for the weeks to come. I don't want to get into weeks to come as hard as that will be to keep kind of staying into where we're at. But I do want to dive in since you have read this book. We've had some great conversations um, about this and how um, important this is. So we start this concept out of Ephesians 6.1, right? A verse that most people have read. I grew up in the church, grew up 
You know, you drug me to church. Yeah, you had, uh, a, you had a drug got, problem. I, well, I don't want to quite say <laughs> I, that, I but my drug parents you. drug me to I church, drug you there. Um, which I'm so thankful for. Um, but uh, Ephesians six twelve um, sets the framework for this, that this is something we need to pay attention to. And I kind of want to say it this way. We've been um, conditioned to really think that this fight is, oh, it's good versus evil. It's God versus Satan. But... There's actually more to this. Not that there's this war that God's going to lose at the end of the day. I've read the end of the book. He wins. But there's more than just one-on-one. There's something else that happened when we read the Bible, and so this sets the framework for that. So this is not God versus Satan. That's a, that's a misnomer. Uh, that happened, and it took about a second for that battle <laughs> to take place. Uh, when Satan exalted himself and said, I can do this, Satan said, no, you can't. And uh, God that said, was it. God said. God, God said. said yeah, no, God can't. said. No, you can't. And and that was the end of that. He was cast out. And then what happened? Uh, so he took a third of the angels with him. Now this is amazing at the deception of Lucifer that he could convince one third of the angels that hey we could we can do this that they were willing to to go with him. So that same attitude of rebellion, the same attitude of pride, the same attitude of self-sufficiency, I don't need anybody else, I can do this, that was the thing that uh, uh, these demons followed. And, and so when you, you said Ephesians six twelve, when it says uh, that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities of darkness. Yeah. So to finish my thought on, this is not God against the devil. This is man against the devil. Yeah. That's so good. God has placed us here to take dominion well, back Genesis. Come on. of what the devil is. We had it. Adam did. And because of his rebellion, his sin, uh, then he gave it back to he gave it to the devil. Now, the church has been empowered to take it back. That's so good. Now, for centuries, the devil had his way, had his rule and did everything he could to try to stop the plan of God that would bring about the Messiah that would then empower the mankind to be able to take dominion back over uh, the planet. And uh, so uh, that's where we see these principalities, this, this pecking order or a structure uh, to the kingdom of darkness. There's a structure to the kingdom of light, to the kingdom of God. There's a structure there. Well, there's also a structure to that. Now, it's run on chaos. It's run with power. It's a dictatorship mm -hmm. of Satan in that. Uh, you know, you, you often think about different gangs. Uh, we understand that from being inner city. And so this neighborhood is controlled by this gang. This neighborhood's controlled by this gang. They're all gangsters. They're all uh, doing illegal activity. They're all of that same spirit and everything. But they're saying, okay, I can, I can run this one and I can run this one. Demonic spirits were doing the exact same thing. When yeah. Daniel uh, prayed, they said, I was hindered. Gabriel said, I was hindered by the spirits that were over Persia. So who, why wouldn't you think then that these demonic spirits throughout time, and because man has come and gone, cultures have changed, but in each one of these cultures, you see the rise of these gods. Why is that? Why, why was there not an atheist culture? Yeah. Why wasn't there just a culture that said, no, we don't There's need no any God. gods? There, there is no culture like that. Uh, they each one then sought after, and I think it was through demonic influence that said, so we talk about idols. Well, they carve these idols up. Well, these idols are just representation, physical representations. They... It gave them a, a, a focal point to mm -hmm. worship. Uh, but it's a demonic spirit that was, that was behind that. So you got this demonic spirit that's controlling this area, another demonic spirit that's controlling this, all under the authority, if you will, of, of Satan and of Lucifer to the point that they're trying to accomplish the same mission, and that's to kill, steal, and destroy, and, and to take, man, take back this earth, take, take away man's position with God. They're jealous of mankind. You made two statements last night uh, about worship and, and demon worship, and the second one I'll get to in a second, but the first one you made that I was just reminded of is you talked about how um, the angels worship God, but the demons, they didn't leave God, their worship of God, to worship Satan. They are under Satan's authority, but they want the worship themselves because with rebellion comes pride. And so these demonic spirits that cover, they are finding their areas, regions, spaces, people that mm -hmm. can find themselves. And so when you use that analogy of like, 
of gangs and turf war or um, hierarchical leadership, heavy handed leadership. People want that. They want to be noticed. Well, we see that and you use that idea of the principalities of Persia, but that idea that they want to be worshipped. No, that they do. And they, they want to be sure that God's not worshipped. So that, that's, that's where they recognize that. So they know the love that God has for mankind. Mm -hmm. And they've seen that demonstrated. They are, they are very jealous of that, of the, of the love that God has for man and the relationship that man can have with God. Why do you think that they went after the children of Israel, the descendants of Abraham, the friend of God? Yeah. Because he taught them you can have a personal relationship with God. You can meet with him. Uh, he will come down and visit with us. And so you see that. Uh, throughout history, and in those areas where that was not, you see paganism from the Tower of Babel. Yeah. Children of Israel fell prey to this. They'd come out of Egypt, uh, which again, I just I I, I don't want to be too hard on them because we're the we're same way. Uh, they had seen God miraculously, supernaturally deliver them out of Egypt, uh, signs and wonders, parting of the Red Sea, uh, manna from heaven, water out of the rock, a pillar of fire at night. I mean, a visible, tangible presence of God that would move and direct them. And an audible voice. And an audible voice. So we, we often don't talk much about that, but remember, God spoke to the children of Israel audibly to the point that it scared them, frightened them. It might them. scare me too. Because <laughs> <laughs> they, they thought, well, now we've got to be accountable to this. No, Moses, you go talk to God and you come back and tell us. In all of that, when Moses went to the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, and he's gone for a few days, he comes back. And these same children of Israel that God had delivered had set up a golden idol, a calf, a bull, and they were worshiping that, that uh, with all of the activities of the worship of the gods of Egypt. Yeah. How in the world could they go back to that? And we see that pattern. And so it is not to think that, that it couldn't happen today. Oh, no, it, it, it happened then. And that was one of the points you made last night, which was... Uh that there's a rhythm of rebellion. Uh, we see it with this, we see it with uh, Lucifer and the third of the angels leaving rebellion. And then we see it throughout history, rebellion, that the enemy is at war, that Satan is at war against the worship of God, m more so than he is for the worship of itself. They're at war with it. They don't like it. You mentioned that. But there's this idea of rebellion and an influence that we've got to, we've got to step in. Do you think that has something to do with the idea of a God void within our heart. Scripture talks about there's a hole within our heart that God sits in. Um, until we find that or if we um, refuse that, there's still this void. You spoke a little bit to that, that, that idea of the God void. It spoke to kingdoms and cultures and kings that allowed the influence. I mean, even into our own life. Can you speak a little bit more so, about that? So uh, you call it the God void. Man was made to worship. Uh, that's one of the things that we were created to do. We were made to, to worship God, to have that relationship. And we, we think of worship um, from a standpoint of, of bowing down and submission and, and Singing? That. Do you want me to uh, sing? Well, no. Uh, <laughs> that type of total submission and, and, and like we think of the worship of idols. Yeah. More of the biblical concept of worship with God is that of relationship and of love and expressing that love and that's where our worship comes that's where that's where you you'll see that uh with mary at the foot of jesus uh as as worship the breaking out of alabaster box so so we think now when demonic spirits think of worship it's a holy it's domination it's you will bow before me you will submit to me and i will take what is the most precious to you and make you give it to me and i will hold you in submission by fear now, that's the type of worship that, uh, that demonic spirits want and what they, they demand. And that's where idol worship comes up. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, it cannot fulfill the void in the heart of man. Look at the prophets of Baal when they uh, had the showdown with Elijah. And at the end of the day, they had given everything. They had given their lives, mm -hmm. but yet nothing, nothing was happening. So that, that's the void. That's the world that was filled. This was the normal thing uh, for, uh, for society, for culture at that time, is to worship gods. 
And so they took what was around them. They allowed it to influence them even into, I mean, you, you talked about the, the Oracle at Delphi last night and the influence it had on, uh, on culture. Let me ask this question. Do you think that, do you think that in our current culture that we're subject to that or our leaders are subject to that on a cultural level that we're allowing influences in that it's impacting? Well, let's, let's go to, let's go back to, um, to history in that. Uh, we, we see all the movies and uh, hear all the stories and we think, well, that's Greek mythology. Uh, but all of that is based upon history. So all of these where we would, well, somebody's got to go find the witches and, and ask them, you know, Hercules and all of those types yeah. of things. Those are all based upon the practices of that day. The Oracle of Delphi it was a place. It was at the uh, uh, there at Delphi, the Temple of Apollos. And what there was is there was a crack in the in the ground there in the earth that apparently uh, there was uh, underground activity. Uh, the smell of sulfur would come up through there uh, of something that was taking place. Steam would rise as we'd see a fissure, yeah. uh, kind of like. Um, not to the extent, but Yellowstone, Old Faithful, and those types of things. So we've seen those types of places. This crack was there. This uh, oracle, which would be a woman, a priestess of that goddess, would set her stool over that where she would be kind of suspended over that crack. And as these, these fumes would rise, she would go into a demonic possession and there could be asked questions and, and sought counsel and kings and emperors and military leaders would come there to find out, should I go to battle with these people? Am I going to win this? What's the next uh, harvest going to be like? And, and so this was a normal practice of kings and emperors to seek the advice of demonic spirits. Yeah. Uh, Saul did that yeah. when he sought out the witch of Endor. This was a normal practice of that day. This is where they were getting their counsel this is where they weren't Googling things. They were going to these oracles and going to these people possessed of demonic spirits that were then influencing and guiding and giving them power to be able to do what they were doing. So the, this is not just mythology. We see all these movies about this, but this is what was happening on that day because of the influence. Now we, we're educated. We know better than that. And so uh, uh, we're not going to be influenced by those types of things. In this series that we're going to do, I'm going to show you, as Jonathan Kahn did, I'm going to bring it to your attention, of literal patterns that we are seeing today, activities that we are seeing today, that go right back to the practices of these ancient gods to show that they are returning, even to the days of the year that oh, yeah. these things happen. That's going to be... So, so can it happen again? I'm going to show you that it is happening again uh, through what Jonathan Kahn has done in his book, uh, Return of the Gods. And it is, uh, it, it is amazing. That's why when I read this, I, I, I said, you, people have got to see this. If this does not show people that there is demonic influence that is trying to kill, steal, and destroy, and that these ancient gods, the way they had people worshiping them back then, there, that same thing is beginning to happen today. Now, we don't have idols that are erected because we've, quote, outgrown that. But the same spirit. Yeah. Do I think that idols could come back? I could just take you to the book of Revelation. I could take you to the rise of the Antichrist and how he will be worshipped yeah. and how he will be feared because of the power that will be in his hand. Is that God's power in his hand? That's demonic power in his hand. So people will talk about that. Yeah. Well, what do you think is going to prepare people for that? That's not just going to show up one day. There is a preparation. I believe that it began where it really became visible probably in the 1950s, early 60s. You know, I uh, get to have conversations with people about culture and what's going on in our generations. And some people have gone as far to say, oh, we're just not spiritual anymore. And I, I challenge that with everything. I feel like we're just as spiritual as generations before. And if I speak to my generation, at least now, and those that are after me, I think there's a hunger for spiritual things. There's a hunger for, uh, yeah, for spiritual things. There's an ignorance. There's a lack of awareness. There's a deception. 
Um, and I think that's where this is really going to speak to, you know, I was having a conversation even yesterday afterwards with people that are with my peers about this. And I still even think there's a desensit desensitizing that has gone on because of culture that almost kind of keeps us wanting from having this away from wanting to have this conversation. But I think there's a necessity in this conversation that's going to open our eyes to seeing what's going on. You ended last night and I want to end today with this. You ended last night going, hey, I'm not bringing this to your attention for doom and gloom. This is not why I kind of want to start with history and then end uh, with your stance last night that even as you talked about the Oracle of of Delphi uh, under the worst emperor in Rome at that time. He goes to her, hey, what do I do with the Christian nation after Jesus has come? Greatest persecution. But then something happens, which then kind of points us to hope as the church now. So uh, that's the world of paganization, of idol worship, of everybody having their own God. I mean, Mars Hill with Paul, he goes, and we got a whole, we got a whole hill here like of different gods. If you want to visualize that, think of a cemetery as you walk in there with all of the tombstones God, God, there. God, 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 God. And all of those were different gods because they just want to be sure they covered themselves with all these little demonic spirits and that. That was the world. Uh, the... Uh, Terrible activities, temple prostitution, child sacrifice, uh, women that were totally devalued in society. Uh, women were made to uh, serve as temple prostitutes. Uh, that was, and so that's accepted. We think of that, how in the world that was, that was accepted, accepted at that normal. day because it was a part of that culture. Yeah. That was the culture that Christianity was birthed into. And uh, the emperor went to the Oracle of Delphi and said, this new faith is going, and, and people are, are, are seeking that instead of looking to our gods, which that's how they control, the government control, because of, quote, the blessing of the gods. And so the Oracle of Delphi said, you've got to stop that. And so the greatest persecution uh, <laughs> came in that uh, time uh, when uh, we had burning of Christians at the stake, feeding them to the lions, everything we could to get them to recant. But yet, even through all of that, Christianity not only survived, it overcame. Yeah. To whereas uh, you saw Constantine, the emperor right after that emperor, declared that Christianity would be the official religion of the Roman Empire. Does that mean he was a Christian and everything? No, but he saw the power of it and yeah. yielded to that. All these uh, idols were coming down now. People weren't worshiping them. Society changed completely. These demons were being exercised out of society. They're still around everything. They're wondering, but they do not have the impact. Uh, uh, human sacrifice, no longer acceptable. Uh, it was acceptable before that. Child sacrifice, acceptable before yeah. that. Uh, all types of, of uh, you know, we talk about adultery, fornication. These are terms that came about because of Christianity. These were things that were accepted yeah. and, and demanded under these pagan gods. So society changes drastically. Western culture changes drastically. Can I add something there before sure. we get to the hopeful close of like, then you fast forward to 300 AD and you dropped that comment where another emperor wants to come back and you know, we're going to go back to the practices of old and tries to go to the Oracle of Delphi yeah. and send somebody which was destroyed, which was flattened out and that we have historical evidence that this emperor wanted to go relive the Roman empire of before and you're trying to find the quote, but, huh? Yeah, because that's you know that's where they gain their power is is through that. So the Oracle of Delphi then responded and right said, "Tell the emperor that my hall has fallen to the ground." The demons had to raise the white flag. <laughs> This is a demonic spirit speaking to the emperor, and they said, "We're going to do this and 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 tell the emperor that my hall has fallen to the ground. The god Apollo no longer has his house, uh, nor his prophetic spring. The water has dried up." Now that's that's the enemy waving the white flag. That's that's recorded in history, and so now they're out. Western civilization. Fast forward two thousand years to where we are today. There's no way to deny that God does not have his place in our society and Western civilization as no. he did before. We, have, we are now kicking him out. Yeah. 
We've kicked him out of the schools. We've kicked him out of the public arena. You can't pray in Jesus' name. All the things that uh, were the foundation specifically of the United States of America, our, our national motto, in God we trust. Um, I mean, there is a fight now just to have that put in city halls. We are moving God out. And when you move God out, like the, like the verse says where Jesus said, when a man is exercised of a demon, a demon leaves, you clean that house. you got to put something in there. And when there's a void there, yeah. when there's nothing there, right, that right, demon will return and yeah. bring seven more with him. It'll be worse before. Post-Christian America is going to be far worse than pre-Christian America or, or civilization. We thought it was bad back then. It's going to get worse today because these gods are returning. They're seeing their opportunity. God's being kicked out of society, so now they're going to make their place. And one of the things that we're going to show you in these next few weeks is specifically, I, I mean detailed, that these gods are reemerging by name, by their celebrations, uh, by why they are even manipulating time and events that would take place because their arrogance and their pride, the gods are returning. So we brought them to awareness. Where do we leave them with encouragement or hope? Well, I'm not, I'm not trying to tell people that there's a demon behind every, <laughs> every rock, hmm. but there probably is. <laughs> I mean, we've got to be aware of, of, the, of the, the battle that is going on. Now, do we have anything to be fearful for? Of course not. No. Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And just as the New Testament church pushed out all of these gods that were running rampant, had the full power of the government, had the full power of, of everything behind them, the truth won out. Yes. The truth the sets wins. people free. And the same thing, I believe, is available to us. Well, and that's why I'm doing this series, not to scare people. But to make people aware of the strategies, uh, we don't need to just we've just concentrated so much on uh, ourselves. You know, we got to be a discipline and discipleship and knowing. But why do you think we need to be disciplined? It's like an army. The reason that the army is so disciplined, you think, well, who's who's the most disciplined group of people? Well, soldiers are. Why yeah. is that? Because they're going to fight a battle. Mm -hmm. And to fight a battle, they got to be disciplined. We've got to disciple ourselves. We've got to discipline ourselves so that we can fight this battle. Uh, good and evil uh, or God and Satan, that battle is over. God won hands down. Our responsibility is to fight the enemy and take back uh, occupy, Jesus said, till I come. That's a yeah. military term. Yes, we've is. got to push back the gates of hell. So we've got to be aware of that. Uh, you're you're an, an athlete, basketball player. Mm -hmm. um, you know that any team, I don't care what, what sport it is, they not only learn their plays and how to execute and be good there, but they're going to send scouts out and they're going to go watch the other team play. Yeah. And they're going to say, all right, what's their play? How do they do this so that we'll know how to counter it or how we'll have an offense that will be able to defeat their that? That's what the return of the gods is about. I'm not wanting to end people with, oh, no, it's all over. <laughs> no, I want to prepare us that we are not going to allow the gods of this world yeah. to have dominion over our so personal good. lives, nor are we going to surrender our, our culture or our society or our nation to them. Yeah. So that's this. Uh, we can sit here and have conversation over and over. Um, and we will for the next uh, seven weeks uh, on Thursdays after our Wednesday night. But come join us on Wednesday nights. If you're in the local area, come join us. If not, we will be posting it. Um, so you'll see that on our YouTube. Uh, but join us in these conversations. Pick up the book. If you got a chance to pick up the yep. book, we'll keep referencing that. Um, read the Bible. You'll see that this is <laughs> all throughout Scripture um, and be encouraged because God is still on the throne. Jesus is still our Savior, and the world's not over yet, and we're going to see more people won for Jesus. And so thank you for watching. Um, join us at Return of the Gods. Anything else? The next week, the possessor. We're gonna, there, there's the, the, there's the, holy, the unholy trinity. There are basically three gods, three spirits that had the most dominance over Israel, and over the world. They manifest in different ways through different cultures, but they'll all be linked back to these three. And we're going to spend the next few weeks looking at each one of those. And I'm going to show you how they manifest in, in our culture today. And I guarantee you, your mouth's going to drop open. when You say, what? And, and you, yeah, it's right there. And we never, and we never, we never saw it. So the possessors, the first one, that's next week.